Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Jonestown and Jim Jones series. If you haven't seen part one yet, please go ahead and check that out first because obviously one comes before two. So just so you guys know, it's garbage day today, so I'm sure there's gonna be like 12 garbage trucks loudly picking up things outside any minute. Okay, let's pick up right where we left off in part one, where Jim Jones has now expanded his congregation. It's getting too big, so he has to buy an actual building for his congregation, and that's where People's Temple comes in. So at first it seemed like Jim Jones and his followers really just wanted to do good for the community and the world. And I really believe that in these first days, especially in these first years, Everyone who joined this church, they wanted to do good for the community. That's why they followed him. They saw somebody who could actually get something done, who gave them an opportunity and a vehicle to make positive change in the world, and they took it. These were people who were good people, and that's what bothers me the most is you didn't see a ton of evil or horrible or mean-hearted people joining up with Jim Jones. You saw good people. You saw some of the best people. These were people who really were selfless and wanted to give to others. And that's what's almost the worst thing about this entire situation. Jim and Marceline had several elderly congregates. The older women especially loved Jim Jones, so they would often go visit these women and men at the senior living communities, and they were appalled at the conditions they saw in these places. They decided to take their own house and open it up to the elderly and since Marcy was a nurse this really worked out because she knew what she was doing. The senior care facility that Jim and Marceline Jones opened up in their house ended up being a wonderful place to be. Marcy was really compassionate. Jim had a knack for coming in and just making everyone smile and putting everyone at ease. They had turned it into a really nice place for seniors to come and stay. This evolved into Jim and Marcy taking over and revamping several senior care facilities around the area. There was three reasons for Jim and Marcy to actually do this. One, it brought in much needed revenue to the church because they didn't have a lot of money at this time. They're basically just taking in whatever they can as far as donations go. Two, it also provided employment to many of the congregates at People's Temple. So you had a lot of people following Jim Jones who didn't have jobs, who were kind of just floating along, they couldn't find anything. And this gave Jim the opportunity to give them something, a job where they could actually work and make a living. Three, it provided Jim with respect in the community. He wanted to gain their trust, and he did. He founded Free Restaurant, which was a cafe style soup kitchen where you could go to get a free meal if you were down on your luck. And Jim Jones and the People's Temple took in a lot of clothes through their clothing drive. So they would bring it to the free restaurant so that people could choose from some new clothes to put on. He created youth programs, free daycare for people who had to work and couldn't afford to put their children into daycare. Jim Jones and the People's Temple did a lot of good things. Jim eventually realized he had to go into politics. He wanted to go into politics. He knew this is where things happen. This is where deals and relationships were made that would make or break you in life. And this is where Marceline came in. She had grown up in that political arena with her father being involved in local politics in Indianapolis. So she actually helped Jim make his way in the political arena because he didn't know what he was talking about as far as politics. And he didn't want to go into these rooms with men who were well politically versed and make a fool of himself. So he would send Marcy to these political meetings like town hall meetings and things and she would take notes and kind of formulate responses and then she would go home and coach Jim on everything she had learned and come up with. He would then go to the important meetings and he would regurgitate all the things that she had told him as if they were his own words and people were like wow this guy really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Marceline at this point is just excited to be viewed now as a partner, even though I don't think he ever looked at her that way. Now we're gonna bring another character into the mix. His name was Reverend Major Jealous Divine. 
Yes, Jalas Devine. That's actually his real name. Who was an African American spiritual leader, and he'd been calling himself God to his followers long before Jim Jones came on the scene. Father Divine had a wife, and her name was Penaniah, and they called her Mother Divine. Jim was really impressed with Father Divine and the hold he had on his congregation and his followers, the way he could literally talk in circles for hours and never say anything at all. And if somebody would ask him a direct question, he would just like, he would say so much random nonsense and you know, things that could almost be grabbed onto and make sense, but just slipped out of your fingertips before they actually did make sense. That by the time he was done talking, people had forgotten what question they asked and Jim thought this was the coolest. So Jim would spend a lot of time visiting with Father Divine. He would go back multiple times and almost become a student of his. Now at this time, Jim Jones is living the true socialist existence. He dresses like, you know, really plain, hand-me-down clothes. His house is furnished with secondhand furniture, kind of all mismatched. He looks like a person who's given his all to the socialist movement. But when he meets Father Divine and walks into his mansion and sees him all dressed up in his snazzy suits, he's like, what? Jim Jones had been having his followers sign over all their belongings and possessions and wealth to him for a while now, but he was actually using that towards the church and the programs they were enacting. I do think this is about the time where that would shift and he would start using some of that money for himself. He would start dressing a little snazzier, you know, like putting nice dark suits on, slicking his hair back. At this time, Jim has some key people around him. Lynetta is still with him, his mother. She's with him all the way. She would end up going to Guyana with him, so she's by his side telling anybody who'll listen that she gave birth to the great man and a spirit told her she was going to. And Patty Cartmel. Patty Cartmel was a woman who was in love with Jim Jones. She believed in every single word he said and she was head over heels in love with him, but he wouldn't become romantically involved with her. He told her she was too heavy for that, but he did put her in charge of scheduling his other dalliances. So basically his romantic schedule, she was in charge of that. He didn't call it a romantic schedule. He called it something else that I cannot repeat here. Jim would eventually end up trying to hook one of his daughters up with Patty's son because she was such a loyal follower. He knew that he could continue on his legacy through Patty's son and through his daughter long after he had left the world. So Jim Jones thought it was time that they start a family. He had to have this image of a family man and a couple years before they had tried to adopt Marceline's cousin, Ronnie. Ronnie had come from a kind of broken home. His mother was into drugs and not really reliable. And Marcy and Jim had felt bad for him. So they took him in and they basically, you know, they took care of him and they raised him for a little while. And they really enjoyed being parents and taking care of somebody. And Jim really enjoyed having another set of ears constantly with him to listen to his rantings and ravings. He stayed with them for quite a while. And then one day Jim was like, hey, we want to adopt you. So, you know, let's get that done. And Ronnie was like, well, I have a mother and I have, you know, a brother and I would really like to be reunited with them again at some time and live as a family. So I, I don't need to be adopted, but I really appreciate everything you've done for me. And Jim's like, no, we're gonna adopt you. We want you to call us mom and dad. And Ronnie was like, nah, I don't wanna be adopted. I don't need to be adopted, I have a mother. And I, I don't wanna call you mom and dad because I have a mom and I feel like that would be disrespectful to her. But once again, I really appreciate all the help you've given me. And Jim was pissed. Marcy was hurt because she did really think that Ronnie would wanna be adopted by them. So she was hurt, but she would eventually get over it. Now Jim was 
really upset. He didn't like that he had given so much to this kid only to have it thrown back in his face. Jim Jones is exactly the kind of toxic personality you want to avoid. This is the person who will do something for you and expect something in return. This is the person that does something because of what they think you'll do for them back. It's really really toxic. Once Ronnie said he didn't want to be adopted, Jim was like, well, whatever, get out of here. Go back to your drug addict mother. We don't want to have anything to do with you. And he dropped him back off, but he would continue to call him for months after and guilt him and be like, oh, you've killed Marcy. Her heart's broken. She cries every day. How could you do this to us? So he like harassed this kid. It was awful. The failed adoption of Ronnie did stick with the Joneses though because they'd enjoyed having a child in their house. And after years of trying, it didn't seem that Marceline was able to have her own biological children, so they adopted again, this time a 10-year-old girl named Agnes, who was rumored to be the daughter of a Native American prostitute. Now, Agnes was a tough child to warm up to. She could be surly. Um, she didn't really seem to like people all that much. She kind of was moody, and this didn't portray the image of this happy-go-lucky family that Jim and Marceline were trying to portray. So they were like, let's try again. And they adopted two Korean children, Stephanie and Lou. Stephanie and Lou were biological brother and sister. So it was really nice of them actually, because they were able to keep the siblings together. And I always like that when it comes to adoption, I feel so sad when there's like two or three kids and they're brothers and sisters and they just get separated because they have to be adopted by separate families. So I really like that, but they were really happy-go-lucky children. They had a great time. Everybody at the temple loved them. They'd run around laughing, smiling, playing. It was just a good time for them. And shortly after Stephanie and Lou came into their home, Marceline did become pregnant with their first and only biological child. One rainy night, the temple members had a field trip or an outing sort of to the Cincinnati Zoo. Marceline was pretty far along in her pregnancy at this point and she had placed herself on bed rest because it hadn't been an easy pregnancy so far. So she didn't go to the zoo but Stephanie and Lou and Agnes did along with multiple other temple members. They all carpooled up there, had a great time, but when they were driving back, the car that Stephanie Jones was driving in was hit by a drunk driver and she was killed on impact. That night, Marceline, who had never claimed to have visions or anything like that before, said she had a vision of her daughter. She was in bed sleeping, it was late, it was rainy out, and there was a knock at her door. She woke up, she got out of bed, and she opened it, and there stood her daughter, Stephanie. And Marcy was like, what are you doing out here? Where's your dad? All Stephanie would reply is, oh, Bulky needs a mommy and daddy. Now, Marcy's tired, she's pregnant, she's exhausted. She'd already been sleeping, so she brings Stephanie in. She doesn't really ask too many questions, just tucks her into bed, and gets back in bed herself, and falls back asleep. Now, Jim Jones would spend that evening identifying his daughter's body at the morgue, and he would come home early in the morning and have to wake Marcy up and tell her what happened. Marcy was obviously confused because she told Jim, there's no way I tucked Stephanie into bed last night. And they went into Stephanie's room and of course her bed was empty. She had not been there. But Marcy did tell Jim about the vision she'd had about Stephanie saying, oh, Bulky needs a mommy and daddy. So they contacted the adoption agency where they'd gotten Stephanie and Lou from. They actually found out Stephanie and Lou had another sister named Oboki. Crazy, right? So is this an actual vision? Is this Marcy and Jim just knowing that Stephanie and Lou had another sibling and just using this to make them seem more powerful, which would be terrible to use your daughter's death to make yourself seem more powerful? Or is this something that Jim Jones basically planted in her head and caused her to actually believe? I don't know. Either way, they adopted six-year-old Oboki immediately and they renamed her Suzanne. Three weeks later, Marcy would give birth to a baby boy who they would name Stephen with an A at the end instead of an E in remembrance of the sister he would never meet. 
And as if losing a child isn't traumatic enough, when they tried to bury Stephanie in their normal graveyard, they were told they couldn't because she was Korean. So they had to go to the African American cemetery in order to bury her. She couldn't be buried with She wasn't allowed to be buried in the family burial plot because she was Korean. It's horrendous. Can you imagine living in these times? I mean, I'm sure some of you did live through these times, but that's just absolutely ridiculous. In 1951, they expanded their rainbow family, their term, not mine, when they became the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child. He was a boy and they would name him Jim Jones Jr. I wonder if Steven was mad because he was the oldest and he was the biological child and Jim Jones would have come after, so have been younger than him and was not the biological child, but he was named after his father. So, and this was obviously an orchestrated move as well. Jim Jones wanted to show people, you know, it doesn't matter if you're black or white or brown or green or yellow. You're my son, you're my son. I'm even gonna name him after myself. So everything was manipulative, everything was planned, everything was thoroughly thought out from beginning to end when it came to Jim Jones. Now that he had established himself as a religious leader, a businessman, a force in politics, and a family man, it was time for Jim Jones to make some real positive social change. And he and his followers were actually really, really important to the integration movement in Indiana at this time. He would do the craziest things, like go to a restaurant, and they all knew him, right? He's an affluent person in society right now, but he'd go to a restaurant that was whites only, and he'd be like, hey, I wanna eat here today, I have a big party. And they'd be like, yes sir, of course, yes, please come in, how many? And he's like, mm, I don't know, like 50 or 60. And they'd be like, oh, amazing, that's great. And he'd go to these restaurants during their slow times when the restaurant's empty and they're not making any money. And he would just be standing there, just himself, telling them that he had a large party coming in. And they'd say, okay, right, it's Jim Jones, he's an important person in the town, and he's got a large party during a slow time when they're gonna make some money. And then once they said okay, and they like set up the tables, he'd be like, okay guys, come in, and all his black congregation would walk up. And the restaurant owners would be like, what? No, 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 no. We, we can't do this. And he's like, what do you mean? You don't have anybody here. You have empty tables. You told me you could accommodate my party. I'm Jim Jones. Why can't you let me and my congregation in? And he'd basically like make a big deal out of it, be loud, be blusterous, be embarrassing until they finally would cave. And then he would actually, you know, give them a stamp of approval basically and let everybody know, hey, this restaurant is friendly to blacks and we work with them. So he actually not only helped in the community with integration, but he helped business owners too. So for a man who was pushing for such controversial things, for a man who was trying to change a system that most people in his city didn't believe to be broken, he didn't have a lot of enemies. He was just too damn likable. There was people who didn't agree with his beliefs, but they would meet him and they'd be like, oh, whatever, we like this guy, he's awesome. So he had to create a false sense of an enemy presence because as you know, people align with you if they feel like they're fighting with you against some enemy force. And he had to create that. So he would fake multiple assassination attempts on himself. He one day would shoot the post on the porch of his house while he was outside and then he ran in the house and he was like, somebody just tried to shoot me. And then there was a time where they had just had church and they were having lunch outside, like the whole congregation, and there was gunshots and then he dropped to the ground. So he'd been shot, right? And then the next day at church, the day after he's been shot, he comes in with this bloody hold up shirt that he's been shot in. So he has bullet holes in this shirt. And he's like, they tried to get me, but they can't. And then he shows his own chest and he's like, I healed myself. So he claims he got shot. And then the next day he healed himself of these bullet wounds. 
and was able to come in and preach for six hours. A lot of them would find out later, of course, that he had just hired somebody to shoot blanks at him and he had not actually healed himself, which I think would be pretty clear, but people believed him. I do believe that this was the time he began to lose his grip on reality. Call me father, call me mother, call me morphodite, call me queer, call me whatever you want, I don't care what you call me, I'm afraid of nobody. He was really obsessed with like nuclear attack and everybody at that time kind of was. This is when you're afraid that you're gonna be bombed at any time. This is when they're making drills for kids in school to hide under your desks because your desk is going to protect you from a nuclear explosion. He told his church that he'd had a prophetic vision that Indianapolis would not survive a nuclear attack they had to find a new place to bring their church. So Guyana is where they would eventually end up, where the mass homicide takes place. But he took his first trip to Guyana in 1961. He liked Guyana because it was a small country, they were socialist, they were English speaking. He went there and he kind of checked it out and he thought, you know, they got a nice place here, but they also have a lot of stuff going on politically. This isn't the right time for us but he always kept Guyana in the back of his mind. So he went back to the drawing board to figure out another place to move the People's Temple. And that's when he read an Esquire magazine article which stated the nine best places to avoid nuclear fallout in the world. Brazil was on that list, so he actually took his family and some other temple members and he moved to Brazil for two years to try to basically set up a church there. It was only when he was there for a while that he discovered the missionary market was pretty much saturated. There wasn't really room for another person to come in and start a new religion. So this was a failed experiment, but he could not let people know that he had failed. He could never let people know he had failed. After he and his family had been there for two years, he came back and he told this story to his congregation about how a diplomat's wife had propositioned him for sex and he turned her down. He was like, no, I'm married and I have my morals. But she would not be deterred. She came after Jim Jones. He was a virile. He was a manly man. Every woman wanted him. And he would actually tell his followers that he was like sexual dynamite. He told them that he just had this animal magnetism that women seemed incapable of resisting and this diplomat's wife was no exception so he would say no she'd say yes and eventually he was like okay i will do this but you have to donate five thousand dollars to the local orphanage because if i have to compromise my morals at least i'm going to do good for the world while i'm doing that to, to think that people are so damn picky about who they go to bed with and particularly you women all you have to do is lay there and by god i've had to keep it going all night he used this fake story as a way to not only remind people how amazing he was in the bedroom but to also show the lengths he was willing to go to for the greater good I've had to crawl in bed with men and put up with for this cause. I've had to lay with women I hated till my skin crawled. The narcissism here is monumental, like beyond monumental. But after being gone for two years, his church had suffered. Without him, their membership was down. People didn't really have an interest in being a part of the People's Temple without Jim Jones and his magnetic personality. And also, social awareness and desegregation had continued trucking on along without him there to move it. And that kind of pissed him off. He was like, wait, there's progress being made without Jim Jones? progress is happening without Jim Jones? This is impossible. His ego would not let him grasp the fact that other people could continue to do things without him there to tell them what to do. He never actually admitted to not being able to obtain a foothold in Brazil. Like I said, he could never admit failure. It would be a weakness and he never wanted people to see him as a normal man. But he did use the assassination of JFK to say, oh, stuff's happening in America and Jim Jones is needed. I have to leave Brazil and the good work I'm doing here having sex with diplomats' wives so they'll donate money to orphanages, I gotta put that aside and come back to the States where I am needed because there's some really tough things happening here. Once he saw that people had left the People's Temple, once he saw that their loyalty wasn't really as intense as he thought it was, his fear of rejection and his paranoia 
magnified. So Indianapolis was dead to him now. He felt like he just couldn't trust the people anymore. The whole place, it was just bad memories of a congregation that had deserted him as soon as he turned his back. Two years in Brazil isn't as soon as you turn your back, but okay. And he was still pushing this nuclear war thing. We still have to find someplace better for this church because Indianapolis isn't it. So he went back to his Esquire magazine article and picked another place on the list and it ended up being in California. River Valley's for the great apocalypse because I've got a cavern deep, deep in the mountains that can take care of every one of you. No fallout can get to you. No radiation can get to you. They chose a small place between San Francisco and Eureka, California called Ukiah. He packs what's left of his congregation, which I believe was under like a hundred people at this time, puts them on buses and he drives them from Indiana to California. And this is a long drive, guys, like a really long drive, especially without Spotify or Pandora or Kindle or Audible or anything to listen to on the way. They were probably playing that I Spy game the whole way and singing like church songs. And it would have been enough to make me leave the people's temple to be on that bus from Indiana to California, hard pass. They settle in Ukiah, and this is right in the middle of the Redwoods Forest. It's, it's really beautiful there, but it's isolated, and the area that he settled in, when you think of California, typically you think of a really liberal, open-minded place, but not this area. They were like really pro-Vietnam War, kind of old school people, very patriotic, very conservative, and when Jim Jones shows up with his mostly black congregation, they were not happy about it, to say the least. Jim Jones would then have to switch up his recruiting tactics and focus more on the wealthy and white people who were now in that nearby community because he needed money. Not only did Jones require wealthy people for his following, but he also really wanted to pick from the dredges of society, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, the prostitutes, the people who had turned to the worst things in life and now pretty much didn't have a life because of the addictions and the cycles they'd gotten themselves trapped in. The reason he did this is because he knew this is where he would find his most loyal followers. He would take them in, he would clean them up, he would give them a job, give them purpose, and they felt they owed their lives to him. They were his most rabid followers. These would be the people in Guyana, holding the guns on the people who didn't want to drink the flavor aid. And this kind of went on for three years, a small amount of growth, kind of just picking up people as he went and creating a compound in Ukiah. But then another tragic event happened that Jim Jones knew he could capitalize on, and that was the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Although the assassination of MLK had nothing to do with Jim Jones or his followers, when he heard about the death and he heard that one of the largest black churches in San Francisco was holding a memorial service for MLK three weeks after his death, Jim Jones packed a bunch of his followers onto some buses again, drove them over to San Francisco to show their support and to lend a hand. And here they continued to recruit people from this church to their church. So they used the assassination of this man, this great man, to get more clout for their church. I'm sure they didn't see it that way at the time because Jim Jones had them so twisted into thinking that this was a moral thing to do or that this was the right thing to do, but Jim Jones always probably knew it was a little shady. His following began to grow. When they first arrived in California in 1966, there was only 86 members. By the end of the 60s, it had grown to 500, and by 1973, he had 3,000 people under his spell. California was also the time when dark and weird things began to happen. He was losing it more and more every day. Sermons turned into meetings that lasted for hours and nobody was allowed to sit down so they could pay better attention. And Jim would actually lock the doors so people couldn't even leave. They couldn't go to the bathroom. People would be passing out in these meetings of exhaustion because he had them working all day and then standing 
at attention for five or six hours while he preached up at the pulpit. Jones started to talk a lot about reincarnation. Now, I believe this is Lynetta's influence on him, but he was reincarnated several times. He was once Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Lenin, and Marx, which I don't know how that happened because Lenin and Marx were alive at the same time. Karl Marx was born in 1818 and Vladimir Lenin didn't die until 1824, so there's an overlap here. He created an inner circle, basically a group of people he trusted the most, but this also became a group of snitches, basically. So he was like, go out, talk to people, get all their deepest, darkest secrets and innermost fears, and then come back and tell me everything. So I have stuff on them. That way, if somebody wasn't conforming or somebody wasn't completely on board, they would know, Jim would know, and he would be able to either sway that person back or scare the crap out of them. So they never had those thoughts again. This also gave him insight into people's personal lives, personal matters, where he could talk to them and not knowing where he'd gotten the information from, he would tell them things about their personal life that they'd never told him. So they thought he was reading their minds, they thought he was on a higher level, and it just improved his clout with his community. His inner circle were also the people he practiced his first poisonings on. Everybody gets a half a glass of, of wine, a little styrofoam cup of wine. I thought, cool, I hadn't drank any alcohol since I'd been in the temple, so a little wine sounded good to me. And so everybody drank and said, well, that's a first. We never had any juice before. Fast forward five minutes, Jones says, you've all just been poisoned. You got an hour to live. And so, you know, obviously, you know, immediate adrenaline. Oh, by the way, guys, there was poison in that wine. You have about an hour to live. JK, guys, you're not gonna die. And he wanted to see how they'd react. And I don't know how somebody didn't really like go up and slug him because that would have been my initial reaction, but nobody did, nobody did. And I think this gave him hope that he could pull this off on a bigger level. Sex also became a big thing in the people's temple at this time. Jim Jones had always been obsessed with sex. I'm not quite sure why. I do think his mother was very open with him about talking about sex when he was like a little boy, like four or five. He would be known to tell neighborhood kids when he was young about sexual things that he shouldn't have known at at his age. Even Marceline's cousin Ronnie would say that Jim would take him out on the porch and preach to him for hours about sex and get really in depth. But he used sex as a means of control. If he saw a young person that he found attractive, be they male or female, he would come on to them. And how could you say no to Jim Jones? He was doing it for the greater good. This was something he really didn't want to do, but he had to do it because it was what was best for everybody. And it really didn't matter if this person was in a relationship or married. Jim Jones broke up a lot of marriages in his day, including his own, because as the People's Temple flourished, his marriage crumbled. Marceline had been aware for some time that Jones was not being faithful, but he had kept it more private and kind of under the covers. So she was like, whatever. But that all changed when Carolyn Layton came on the scene. She became more to Jim than just a sexual conquest. She became his right hand woman, his partner in crime. He saw in her what Marceline was lacking, grit and darkness. Marceline was a nice person. She didn't have it in her to do the things that Jim wanted to eventually do, and he knew that. She was immediately an integral part of his leadership at People's Temple, and People's Temple was unique in the fact that a lot of the people in its leadership structure were women. But obviously, I think Marcy was more pissed that he confided in Carolyn, that he used her as a partner, that he trusted her in an advisory capacity. Marceline had always wanted to be considered that equal partner to Jim. She'd always wanted to be seen as somebody he could trust and whose opinion mattered. So him having relations with Carolyn, I don't think bothered her as much as him actually viewing Carolyn as a respected and equal individual. Carolyn and Jim Jones even had a son together, Chemo, and Jim Jones's biological son, Stephen, he remembers Chemo really fondly. He said he loved that little boy. He wasn't a huge fan of Carolyn, his mother, but he loved his little brother, and because of his love for Chemo, he tolerated Carolyn and Jim's relationship, which was very public, 
Jim told everybody about it. He would go to her place and spend nights. He would bring her to his house and the kids could hear them in the other room. Oh, Carolyn was actually married when she came to People's Temple. She came to People's Temple with her husband, Larry Layton. And when she became one of his confidants and in his inner circle, Jim basically looked at Larry and was like, hey, she's not your wife anymore. I'm gonna take her, but here's another girl. She can be your wife now. That's what Jim did. You were not in a relationship. You were not married. You were not with somebody unless Jim Jones said you were. He would pick who you'd be with. And if he wanted who you had, you didn't have that person anymore. So as we discussed before, when Jim worked at Walter Reed Hospital, he was really good at functioning on no sleep and he would do this for years. But as he got older and his to-do list tripled, this became harder to maintain. He would turn to amphetamines to keep him up. Well, he took so many amphetamines that he couldn't fall asleep when it was actually time to fall asleep. So he had to take quaaludes to bring him down. So all this drug use, like back and forth, uppers, downers, constantly on some sort of drugs, it actually caused a little bit of a change in his physical appearance. And this is why he took to wearing dark glasses. He would wear these sunglasses night and day, 24 hours a day. And he told people the reason he was wearing the glasses was because the power of the Lord had become so strong in him that if he took the glasses off and they looked him in the eye, they would be incinerated by the heat and the power from his eyes, his naked eyes. So he had to wear the glasses for their protection. The real reason he was wearing the glasses is because his eyes were puffy and bloodshot and watery and red. And I'm not talking staying up all night studying for finals red. I'm talking Voldemort red. And you're saying Voldemort doesn't have red eyes, Stephanie. Well, yes, he does in the books, just not in the movies. So the real Voldemort has red eyes, but I digress. The use of amphetamines will turn a normal person a little paranoid and a little anxious. So it turned an already paranoid and anxious person into an absolute crazy monster. When he went on the revival circuit, he started bringing like all his followers with him every time. He refused to have another Brazil incident where he'd leave and come back and find people had deserted him. He purchased a fleet of decommissioned Greyhound buses so that he could basically have everybody with him all the time, they would never leave his side. He's like an abusive, controlling husband at this point. This was also the time he brought faith healings to a whole new level. So remember before he would have two plants, one would pretend to have cancer and one would pretend to help get the cancer out. Well now he would just grab complete strangers, unsuspecting strangers from the crowd and be like, hey, you have cancer, did you know? And they're like, what are you talking about? No, I don't have cancer, I didn't know that. And he actually had one of his followers dress up like a nurse, go out to the crowd, to the person that Jim had pointed out and, and you know, kind of confirm his diagnosis. Because nurses can detect cancer just by looking at you. And then she would say, yes, you do have cancer and we're gonna get it out of you. So they bring this completely random person on stage that had no idea what was going on and they would work their magic and by some sleight of hand, I still don't understand how, but the nurse would end up taking the chicken livers that they used, the rotted, blackened, disgusting chicken livers that they said was the cancerous mass and they would like shove it into the person's mouth and have the person spit it out again. Now how somebody can shove something into your mouth and you don't realize it, I don't know, but either way the person would spit it out. And Jim didn't want anybody to get a close look at it, so he would also have one of his other followers close by to grab the mass and then just like eat it so that nobody could, could see it. And when I read this, I dry heaved for just like 10 minutes straight. It was, it was so, so gross of a thought. I just saw it happening in my head and why do you have to eat it? Why can't you just grab it and like put it in your pocket? Nobody's gonna attack you for it. Nobody's gonna be like, I saw you put that lump in your pocket, give it to me. If you're quick enough to grab it and eat it, why can't you be quick enough to grab it and put it in your pocket? I just don't understand. I tell you what though, this would have been my last day at People's Temple once again. It would have been my last day. Jim Jones even had merch. He would sell pictures of himself that he'd blessed for $5, telling the person who was buying it that it would protect them for some time before they needed to buy another one once the power wore off. A young boy said he even saw Jim Jones place one of these magic photographs on a dead bird once, and the bird sprung to life and flew away. They would sometimes sell up to 600 
photographs at each sermon. Jim Jones also made up his own history and his own facts. He would go on and on and on about what a great man Joseph Stalin was, what great things he'd done for his country. And for the most part, people just kind of believed him. They didn't take the time to look into it themselves. They were not always educated. They weren't always up on current events and they didn't question this. But one guy did at one point, he was like, uh, I, I don't think he was like that good of a guy. He was responsible for millions of people dying. And Jim like publicly embarrassed him and called him out and yelled at him in front of everybody. He was like, you have the balls to question me in my church? My church, I mean, it's everybody's church. It's the people's church, but my church, you have the balls to question me in my church about history and facts and socialism, which I'm the expert on. But he brought him aside later and he said, you're smart, I could use a man like you in my inner circle. You know what you're talking about. He told him, he told him, you know, these people, my people, they're simple people. They don't have time for facts and reality. We can't come at them with all this book stuff. We have to make it easy for them. He then told him basically like, don't ever call me out in public again. And then in the next minute he was like, but I do think you're really smart. Could use a guy like you. He really believed in the keep your friends close, but your enemies closer thing. And he knew that somebody like this, somebody who actually knew what they were talking about, somebody who didn't blindly just believe everything they were told, he could become a problem for the temple. Bring those who would question him closer to him where he could keep an eye on them, where he could make certain they weren't causing any trouble, but also give them purpose and position. So they'd be beholden to him and they would choose loyalty over logic. Jim Jones was extremely adept at making allies out of would-be opponents. Jim then demanded that people begin to call him God. He said, I'm God, you're God. We're all God, God is in you, not in the sky. It's not your sky God. Your sky God doesn't do anything for you. He said, this black book has held down black people for the last 200 years. He said, but I'm gonna show you this has no power. So he leaned way back like a football player and he flung it. And when he flung it and let it go, the place got dead quiet. Like... And he waited till it hit the floor, pow. When it hit the floor, he stood and he looked back and forth. He said, now, did you see any lightning come from the sky and strike me dead? Nobody's gonna come out of the sky. There's no heaven up there. We'll have to make heaven down here. He said, if you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. He said, even so, if you see me as your God, I'll be your God. And it seemed the crazier he got, the more sane, and logical, the people who began to follow him were. Tim Stone was an up and comer at the DA's office in Mendocino County. He was introduced to the temple and its leader when it was suggested to him that he used the group to help renovate the Mendocino district attorney's offices. Tim was really impressed with their work ethic, how friendly and open and kind they seemed, but he was especially impressed with their leader who seemed to get right down in the trenches with the rest of his people. He was scrubbing toilets just like everybody else. Tim Stone had these beliefs of integration and equal rights, and he was a heavy proponent of it. So when he saw somebody who was actually walking the walk and talking the talk and living the way everybody else was just saying they wanted to live, he was taken in by this. Now this is a smart guy. He's a lawyer. He's heavily respected in Mendocino County and beyond. He's an ADA. He was on his way to becoming really successful in his field. But then he and Jim Jones became friends, and in 1970, Stone moved his offices to Ukiah, and he and his wife joined the People's Temple, and Tim Stone became their official legal counsel. When Tim and his wife Grace Stone joined the People's Temple, he became immediately integrated into the inner circle. Jim Jones knew he was important, he knew important people, he was 
an officer of the law that he could use him and he immediately began to give him a lot of work and a lot of responsibility. Because of this, Tim and Grace's marriage suffered and she would tell other people at the temple how bad it was, how she didn't see him. He was always tired because of the workload Jim Jones was putting on his plate. And of course, these are spies, right? So they report back to Jim that the Stone's marriage is crumbling and he, well, he jumped on that opportunity. Jim Jones moved in on his buddy Tim's wife. His ability to take whatever he wanted, to steal another man's wife right out from under him, gave Jim Jones an incredible feeling of power and control that he desired more than anything. But he also wanted to put Tim in his place a little bit. Tim Stone, like I said, was smart. He was somebody who knew what he was talking about and he gained a lot of respect in People's Temple in a short time that he'd been there. And Jim saw this as a threat, obviously. He's an insecure person who doesn't want to share the spotlight. He wanted to use Tim's smarts and knowledge and connections for his own benefit and his own uses, but he didn't want anybody to think that Tim Stone was smarter than Jim, not smarter than God himself. He had to do something to set the hierarchy right again, so he slept with Tim's wife, and it wasn't long before she became pregnant. Pregnancies were very common in the People's Temple. Jim Jones was basically sleeping around with whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and obviously these women would sometimes become pregnant, but he would make them get abortions because he said it went against everything socialism stood for to bring more people into the world. But when Grace Stone got pregnant, he saw this baby as a way to basically let his friend Tim know he had to slow his roll. This child could be used as a constant reminder to Tim that Jim was superior to him in every way, even when it came to his wife. John Victor Sloan, also known as John John, was born on January 25th, 1972. On his birth certificate, the father is listed as Tim Stone, but Jim Jones has Tim write and sign an affidavit, basically saying that Jim was the actual father. Here's what the affidavit says. I, Timothy Oliver Stone, hereby acknowledge that in April 1971, I entreated my beloved pastor, James W. Jones, to sire a child by my wife, Grace Lucy Stone, who had previously, at my insistence, reluctantly, but graciously consented thereto. James W. Jones agreed to do so reluctantly after I explained that I very much wished to raise a child, but was unable after extensive attempts to sire one myself. My reason for requesting James W. Jones to do this is that I wanted my child to be fathered, if not by me, by the most compassionate, honest, and courageous human being the world contains. The child, John Victor Stone, was born January 25th, 1972. I am privileged beyond words to have the responsibility for caring for him, and I undertake this task humbly. With the steadfast hope that said child will become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ and be instrumental in bringing God's kingdom here on earth, as has been his wonderful, natural father. I declare under penalty of perjury that this foregoing is true and correct. Like, this letter is embarrassing. He made this guy write that he had begged his wife and Jim Jones to have sex so they could have a baby because he wasn't virile enough to do it. And he's just so happy to be able to raise this child now. How embarrassing. But it wasn't enough for Jim Jones to embarrass one person at a time. He had to kill two birds with one stone with this affidavit, because signed as a witness is Marceline Jones, his wife. He made his own wife sign this document as a witness. This was her last straw. It's so sad because Jim Jones took a woman like Marceline and she would have been such a bright light in the world. She would have gone on to do really good things for other people. He extinguished her light over and over and over again until she just refused to light back up. Marceline had a state job as an inspector and she would inspect healthcare facilities around the area and she often traveled for work so she'd be gone for a couple days at a time. But within months of signing Tim Stone's affidavit, she would get her own apartment in nearby Santa Rosa, about 60 miles away, and she would return to the People's Temple only on weekends. She did her part of playing the devoted wife and temple member, but those who knew her could tell she'd checked out, and newer members who hadn't known her when she was all shiny and new, they said she was kind of detached, hard to get to know, hard to get close to. While Jim was making his way through every female temple member he could, it never occurred to him that his wife, who was still an attractive and young woman, would also catch the attention of male eyes. One day she came back to the People's Temple and she said, I want to divorce you. I'm done. 
I've met a nice psychiatrist. He lives in Georgia. I'm gonna divorce you, I'm gonna take our kids, and we're gonna go to Georgia so I can marry him and live there. Jones didn't respond to this immediately. Instead, he calmly gathered all their children into the room so they could have a family meeting. And he started the family meeting by saying, hey kids, you know, your mom wants to break our family up. She wants to leave me and she wants to take you too. She wants to take you away from this wonderful place with horses and pets and all your friends and family where you can just play all day long. She wants to take you away from all of that. Now, what do you guys think about this? Now, of course, they're kids, right? So this is the place they know. Their friends are all here. They have horses. I mean, horses? Who could say no to that? And when Jim took a poll, the majority of them said they wanted to stay with him. And he was like, ha, see, they want to stay with me. And she said, basically, okay, well, you got that out of your system. I'm still going to divorce you, and I'm still going to take the kids and get custody of them. So that's that. This is when he snapped, started screaming at her in front of the kids, and he said, if you leave and you take my kids, the Avengers of Death are gonna strike you down. And once again, she's kinda like, okay dude, do you know who you're talking to? It's me. I'm not one of your followers. I've already figured out that you're a fraud. You don't have the power to send the Avengers of Death after me. So, so when that threat didn't scare her, he switched to more persuasive methods lowered his voice, went into regular Jim Jones mode instead of preacher Jim Jones mode, and said, if you do this, you'll be dead. And she believed him. See, by this time, Jim Jones already had a well-armed, well-trained militia surrounding him. She knew if she tried to leave, he would have her killed. Marceline Jones' last glimmer of hope at having a real life and a real relationship and normalcy kind of just was snuffed out at that point. And she resigned herself to life as Jim Jones's wife and became a very sad person after that. Marceline was not the only person who was sad. Her son, Stefan, would try to kill himself three times when he was 12 years old, three times. And he would try to do it using the quaaludes that his father kept around the house so that he could go to sleep. But instead of removing the quaaludes after the first time his son used them to try to kill himself, Jim Jones just kept them around and he tried again and again. And the way Jim reacted to this was kind of indifferent. Like he didn't really want people to find out about it, but that was really all he cared about. It seems like Stephen was the only child who really had an issue with his father and living in the people's temple. To hear him talk as an adult and to hear Jim Jones Jr. talk as an adult, they both obviously understand their father was a bad man in the end who did bad things. Jim Jones Jr. says he doesn't remember a happier time in his life than he had in the People's Temple and later in Guyana. He really enjoyed it and he thinks that it was a good way to grow up and Stephen does not feel that way. So I'm not sure what about the two kind of had them experiencing different things, but living with the same parents in the same place, basically the same life, why they had such different experiences. But so that's going to be it for part two. I did not know this was going to go into three parts, guys, just like I didn't know the West Memphis three case was going to go into three parts, but there it is. I hope you guys are liking this series so far and I will see you in part three. Have a wonderful day. Stay kind and stay beautiful. for the great apocalypse because I've got a cavern deep, deep in the mountains that can take care of every one of you. No fallout can get to you. No radiation can get to you. He got you so far in, you couldn't imagine getting out. You couldn't talk to anybody about what you'd seen. You were working like crazy. You weren't sleeping. And my father could in an instant identify what was most important to you. 
uh, and probably what you were most afraid of. Call me father, call me mother, call me morphodite, call me queer, call me whatever you want. I don't care what you call me. I'm not afraid of nobody. Gradually, you realize you'd been sucked into uh, a situation where if you left, that you were a traitor and he had vowed to have all traitors killed. Mr. Slide, do you think your husband is so far gone that he would even try to kill you? Oh, yes. Without hesitation. I am a defector. I'm a traitor to him. Everybody gets a half a glass of, of wine, a little styrofoam cup of wine. I thought, cool, I hadn't drank any alcohol since I had been in the temple, so a little wine sounded good to me. And so everybody drank and said, boy, that's a first. We never had any juice before. Fast forward five minutes, Jones says, you've all just been poisoned. You got an hour to live. And so, you know, obviously, you know, immediate adrenaline. Now, looking back on it, would the appropriate response for me have been, as soon as that meeting was over, to get the F out of Dodge. Men and women were in effect divorced and asked to remarry each other. To, to think that people are so damn picky about who they go to bed with, and particularly you women, all you have to do is lay there, and by God, I've had to keep it going all night. If he saw a young person that he found attractive, be they male or female, he would come on to them. And how could you say no to Jim Jones?